be present as you are inviting us to do in the in the song you don't have to close your eyes but just be present to this moment as we move forward sometimes we're always moving forward and we forget just to be breathe and be aware that in this moment I mean just to really anchor what we already believe into our reality which is anything that you've ever experienced of the divine, while you were reading, a spiritual experience you've had, anything and all, everything, not just one thing, everything that you've ever experienced about what divine is, is here. It might have been a long time ago or in a different space, but when we've touched an eternal reality, it's forever. So all of that is contained in this moment. You don't have, as we move forward in the service, we're not moving forward like getting more spirit, like there's more spirit in the next five minutes or the next 20 minutes than there is right now. So we start with already having it, right? So we just want to be conscious and just be grateful that we already have it right now, all of us. And we're sitting in a room and online with people who already have it. And we're all consciously recognizing in this moment, we already have it. Isn't that awesome? We just breathe that in, that we are divine beings of light and love, and nothing, nothing can ever limit us. And so we're fully realizing that now. We are fully that lighthouse here and now. So thank you for showing up as conscious and enlightened beings of truth. So we are talking about authentic self, and so I thought there's no better way to begin a talk on authentic self then from an anecdote from Gina Davis's book, she came out with a book recently, a memoir, called Dying for Politeness. And she tells this great story. She was eight years old, and she was her grandfather, I think it was his grandfather, um, it was, or her, oh no, it was her uncle, and he was 99 years old, and he's driving the car. His wife, who was a little younger, is in the passenger side. She's with her parents. She said, I think they put me in the middle to make sure I was safe in case there was an accident. So they, they would get smashed, and I'd only a little bit die. <laughs> and so they're driving down, and he's kind of swerving into the other lane, but there's no other traffic on the road. So he sort of crosses the double red line, comes back and drives. <laughs> Nobody says anything. They just keep letting him go. She goes, but one time he starts drifting off into the other lane, and now there's a car coming from the opposite direction. Just no one says anything, and we're heading right for that car, and we're all seeing it, and nobody says anything, and we're getting closer. And she goes, and just at the last minute, his wife says, why don't you veer a little to the right, Jack? <laughs> and he veers to the little right, and he just drives by with horrified people in the car next to him, driving by her. And she said, I realize in that moment, my parents would rather die than be not polite. <laughs> <laughs> I just laughed so hard. She said, that is New England politeness. It comes before everything. And we all know that, that level of politeness. We see that in the old movies, like a lot of those period movies where you have to wear all the corsets and you have to have the right bow and you have to say, even now, what I've heard is like, if you meet the, well, we don't have a queen anymore. But when there was a queen in England, there's all sorts of rituals you have to do. But in the past, Society was filled with rituals of how we were supposed to behave with other people. And we all knew the role that we were supposed to play and, and the rituals. And this has gone back to indigenous cultures. There's, always, there's been throughout society these, these rituals that you learn as being part of a culture of how you're supposed to behave. And I think now more than ever, it really started in the 60s, this breaking down of those, those strong rituals of what you're supposed to do, this, this organized politeness. <clears throat> I mean, if you look at the corsets, and they have, I mean, you, they just look repressed. You know, you can't, every actress who talks about going in those corsets, it's like getting your insides turned out, but you look good. So that all started to fall away in the 60s and has continued to, that sort of a defining characteristic of postmodernism is what we don't have to follow the rules. I mean, in the old days when you went to church, you had to get really dressed up, remember? Patent leather shoes, or at least I had to wear patent leather shoes. Oh, 
<laughs> and, and I always had it, I always had to have a dress on. You know, so all of that has fallen away as being inauthentic. I, even I was thinking, this is a conversation Jack and I had, even at, at his school, the students call the, all the teachers by the first name. And I'm like, well, they at least should say Miss or Mr. first name, but there's just, there's no, so we've gotten rid of all formality, not all formality, but a lot of the formality. And we know that a reason, one of the reasons why is because it was highly repressive. People weren't always being authentic. They had to follow the rules more than they could say, speak, speak from their heart. We know that a lot of people were left out. It was highly exclusionary. So all of these things are wanting to be rectified. Let's be who we really are. Let's let the walls drop away and, be who, and just be whatever is. And there's so much more freedom in that. At the same time, I was struck when I went to Agape, which is, I think you all know at this point, I've talked about a spiritual community down in LA. Uh, Reverend Nirvana, who was one of the ministers there, he's, he and his family have a big family, have a huge ritual on Kwanzaa. They have a big Kwanzaa celebration. And felt very honored when my first husband, myself, and my mom were invited to participate. So we went to his house. It was filled, and uh, clearly this is something they do. They all know the ritual of it, so we were just sort of being respectful and learning, you know, just, of course, love, I mean, it's Nirvana, it's very loving, but also there just seemed to be some things to learn. And at one point, after people had been talking and eating and socializing, his son, who was about 18 years old, tall, and just this magnificent young man, he's now, I keep saying he's a young man, he's actually grown with kids and all that. But at the time, he was a young man. He, his, there was an elder in the room, and he gets down on his knees, and everyone goes quiet. And I don't know, he addressed her in a certain way. I don't remember how that way was. But he asked, in essence, Sage, whatever his words were for that, we would like to begin our drumming now. Do we have your permission? to begin the drumming. And she said, yes, you have my permission. And then the drumming was just amazing. But that moment moved me. Just like, wow. Just to see that young man get on his knees and ask permission from my elder. And I think, wow, we, all these, we've so gotten rid of every, bout, like so rid of all rituals or feel like they're all bad because they're inauthentic. But I'm thinking, was that inauthentic? Him, I mean, yes, it was part of the ritual that they do every year, and the, and the young son is expected to do that before they start the drumming, but is that inauthentic because it's part of a, a consistent ritual? And I'm not answering the question. I just think it's an interesting question as we go through society and through our life. What do we call inauthentic and authentic? Are we, if you're working through something in your life, if there's something up for you, and you come to, to service on a Sunday morning, and you're friendly, and you're social, is that inauthentic? Is being authentic telling everybody what's going on for you and sharing everything? Is that more authentic than just being polite and kind and then on your own doing work? I feel like that was a leading question, but it's something to, in, it's, it's an interesting one for me. Because we do want to be authentic. We want to connect with people authentically. We want them to see our true selves. That's why I think, I mentioned last week, when, the, when this researcher looked it up, there's like four million workshops on how to be authentic. So this is clearly something people are hungering and thirsting for. I want people to see the real me, not the phony me, or the made up me, or the me that was created by my culture or my family. I want them to see me. So what does that mean when we show up? If, I, am I, if I'm working on something and I show up on a Sunday, or if I have, you know, in, in, our, in the past history of our teaching, sometimes people, if you had a cold, you wouldn't show up because that meant like a failure, or if you had the flu, or, you know, can, can you be honest about what's going on in your life? I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I actually don't have an answer to that. I just think it's interesting. What is being authentic? When I first uh, started working in a psychiatric hospital, this is pretty much 30 years ago, 
actually, I want to give a little caveat over here about, because I've talked about working in the psychiatric hospital, and I've had people come and talk with me personally that I talk very glowingly of my experience there, and people have had not always such glowing experiences. And I, I want to say, it was a very particular time, it was a private hospital, it was at a time where they were doing a lot of, it was a very therapeutic focused, it was a private hospital, so they focused, people stayed a long time, did a lot of healing work. They no longer are in existence because health insurance wouldn't cover that anymore, that type of work. So I know I am talking about something very specific and I want to honor knowing that there's a wide, I am not talking, this is everyone's experience working in having in the mental health arena. So I just wanted to say that. I do know that and, um, and I'm sorry because I wish everybody had. Uh, I, wish our hosp I wish our health insurance companies would cover serious therapeutic work that isn't just medication based because it's incredibly beautiful and profound. And that's what I felt when I was there. People who came to this hospital were not, they were at the, the end of their rope, often highly depressed or highly anxious, or their internal, everything was off, you know, off seltzer, bipolar, hearing voices, whatever it was, they weren't feeling on top of the world. They weren't, they didn't have masks on. By the time they were there, all the masks were stripped. And to me, that was like the greatest honor. To me, I had this wonderful gift of being able to sit with people in the moment. Their souls are naked. They're not pretending to be anybody. They're just being raw and open. And there's nothing hidden. They're not, no phoniness, no masks. And of course, my job, I wasn't their therapist. My job was just to sit, and I was given, assigned six residents every sh shift, and usually they stayed the same over time, so I would get to know them, and I would just sit and talk with them. Not to therapize, just to connect with them. So of course, I can't connect with them if I have my masks up. So we're connecting heart to heart, soul to soul. It was the most extraordinary job. I couldn't believe I was getting paid for it. And I remember, I remember this so clearly, one day walking outside and looking around at people, I'm like, wow. Everyone's walking around with this mask, and I'm working in a place where nobody has masks. That was my initial thought as I was first doing it. I'm like, I liked it in the hospital. I liked the rawness. I liked the realness. And I felt like most people are walking in the world pretending. Then I moved out to LA, and I was going to this, I was in this community, the, the Agape community, and I remember there was one woman there and she was always depressed for years. And she was doing therapy all the time. And what I remember her saying was, I'm being authentic. And then I started thinking, hmm, I'm not sure if I like all this. I'm like, does being authentic mean always? Because what I recognize, I, it, it, what I realized in my own self, oh, when we're raw, when we're full of shame, when we're full of vulnerability, that's authentic. And if you're happy and feeling good, or if you're being polite on a Sunday service, that's fake. So I had to rework my, under, like, hmm, I'm not sure if that's actually true. We, maybe we can be multiple things. Authenticity, who are we when we are experiencing this incredible self of who and what we are is authentic. Because um, even as I've been reading, as I told you, that, or if you look in the spiritual journal, this whole month is authenticity, next month is vulnerability. But even as I'm reading about authenticity, over and over and over, the topics come up, vulnerability and shame. I'm like, wow. Like, what that means is we don't want to hide our shame. We don't want to hide our vulnerability. But is that all that authentic means? Like there's just a, there's a, there's a, it feels unbalanced. So I want to talk, re reaffirm that being authentic, we have to start first and foremost knowing that we are spiritual beings. That has to be the core of our authenticity. We are not, we weren't just born 
from a human psychological point of view. That is an expression of this beautiful infinite self that we all are. And that infinite self is radiant and beautiful and full of love and full of joy. That is our natural state. So being authentic, it doesn't, so then, but then you get into spiritual bypass. So if our authentic state is joy, love, peace, and beauty, and that's who we really are, you take all the stuff away, but at the core of our being is all this radiance, then we have spiritual bypass. Well, then I shouldn't feel vulnerable and shame and blah, blah, blah. So that's what we've been trying to, I think why there's so much work now about being authentic is how to hold these two things together, how to be the spiritual being and how to be authentic with your, the stuff that's vulnerable and feels less than and feels like you're nothing and etc. So a few things to say about that. <laughs> Why am I here otherwise? <laughs> so I, so I, want, I want to come at it a little bit differently, which is when I was growing up, I grew up in a family that was very um, independent oriented. So they were very much about finding your own voice. Not just for me, but that was sort of the world I lived in. What are you interested? Think about it. Think critically about it. We will support you, whatever your desires are, but who are you? Don't let anyone else influence you. You are you. So I had a lot of that. People I grew up had a lot of that. It was very much what we heard with Carl Jung, be your individuate is the expression. We are here to individuate, find our voice. Find our voice was a big one. That was a big one for me in college. Find my voice. I was too shy. I didn't speak up enough. What did I want to say? What did I have to say about things? That was a big process. And there's something so powerful in that and brilliant. But then there was this whole other thing that I started recognizing years later. Oh, so even well, in terms of finding your voice, that's our community. So you're not here if you haven't found your voice. And, and I've mentioned this before, I haven't done it in a long time, but for, for years as I was doing classes, I would ask people to bring in the five books that had the most profound effect on them. And what always surprised me, because you know, there's Eckhart Tolle, there's Deepak Chopra, Marianne Williamson, I thought everyone would be coming in and bringing in the same books. There was hardly any overlap. I mean, there was a few, but not much. Over and over, class after class, wow. I think we're all just alike, and I think we're all reading the same things and doing the same practices, but if you actually ask people what inspires you, what's the thing that's had the biggest impact on your spiritual journey, it's actually quite unique. So we are a community of people who know there's oneness, but we're also a community of people that have found our voice. We have found who we are, what resonates with us, what matters to us, and it's all very different. So we're all authentic. So it was quite startling when I was reading about these these monks on Mount Athos, because it's almost the exact opposite. And I never, this was totally new for me, because everything was about being independent when I was growing up. Here, so some of you might have backgrounds like this, but he, here, like all these monks, there's, there's Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox, but basically they're all doing the same thing. So they're reading the same book, they're saying the same prayers at church, they say the same structure. They have a prayer, the Jesus prayer, that they all are working on to say 24 hours a day. So it's exact opposite of us. Everything is exactly the same. And what amazed me was how unique they all were. That even when everyone is studying the exact same thing, reading the exact same poor, the, reading the exact same phrases and doing the exact same prayers and having the same structure day in and day out, 365 days a year, their unique personalities could not be hidden if they tried. And that was eye-opening to me. I thought you had to try to find your voice because it was something you had to get. It was something you had to figure out. But yet, it seemed to naturally emerge. We can't help it. They had shy people. They had, they had funny people. They had people who loved music. They had people who wanted to work with their hands. Like just people's natural propensities shone forth. And I thought, wow, we don't have to try so hard. <laughs> I remember Ramana Maharshi there was, um, lived at the same time Gandhi did. And one of Gandhi's devotees, people, had visited Ramana Maharshi and said, after spending time with Ramana, I said, well, I'm going back to Gandhi's ashram. Do you have any advice that you would like me to give to him? 
and Ramana Maharshi said, <laughs> Ramana Maharshi said, tell him he doesn't have to try so hard, he's already there. <laughs> We're already our voice. We don't have to find our voice. We are our voice. We don't become our voice. We just show up in who we are authentically in each and every moment. We feel into whatever is calling us forth and give who we are. What's, what's emerging from us. And the more we know ourselves as spiritual being, the more freedom we have. So you don't, you don't, you're not doing something because you have to, but because you authentically want to show up in a certain way. So there doesn't need to be spiritual bypass. Because when those things come up, we can be authentic about those. I think of, and I've shared, for I, I, some of you are new, so I'll share the story again. The, um, well, I feel, oh, whatever. I'll share it again, even if you heard it. <laughs> so the um, I was in ministerial. I went a retreat, feeling very small, feeling very ashamed. By the way, I was reading Brene Brown was distinguishing guilt and shame. Guilt is something that you do and you can feel badly about, but you can also change it because you're conscious. And she said, shame is worse because you feel like it's who you are. It's not something you just did. It's who you are. And I was in a moment of shame. I just felt like this is who I am, and suddenly everybody could see it. That was an authentic moment. <laughs> but also, and equally authentic, was when I was with Reverend Nirvana, and he started talking to me about the truth of how he saw me. He wasn't denying my shame. He didn't say, oh, no, you don't feel that. That's not who you really are. He completely saw and felt and my shame and met me there and said, and when I look at you, this is what I see. And he started telling me what he see, saw. And as I've shared about you know, just the love that pours through him, I can't remember a single word he said because this love energy was flowing through. It was like wave and wave of love after love. It was just whoosh. And in a moment, I was healed from being that shame. That was no longer my being. It might feel sad again, but it's not who I was. That was just as authentic as feeling the shame. They work together, and we can heal together. Now, if I had to shut down and feel shame and hide, I would have never had that healing. If I had gone into my room and not opened myself up to a uh, a spiritual being to remind me who I was, that would have stuck. That shame that I was feeling, it would have stuck and gone even deeper. That, that There's a book I'm reading, I've heard some of you have already read it, The Body Keeps Score, that the, when we keep these emotions inside us, our body remembers it. They become reality. The moment we expose our vulnerability or our shame to truth, to this light, it is not to say, they're both real in that moment, but ultimately what is real is the light. Because what I remember from that moment, I have to remember the shame. I don't feel the shame when I talk about it. I remember the love. When we really connect with our authentic self, we are able to be different beings in different situations. When it's inauthentic is when we are repressing it. So for instance, I can be polite and friendly if I'm going through something, but at other moments, at appropriate times, I can be vulnerable and share that. I can be, if someone's talking and they really need to be heard, I can defer to what they're saying and say, I really hear you. I don't need to shut them up. I don't need to show who I am. I can really listen and say, oh, okay, I can hear you. There's other times where I can speak up and say, no, I need my voice needs to be heard. I'm saying me, I'm, I'm saying this for all of us. <laughs> we can speak up and say, no, I can be heard. Authentic authenticity means we have choice. If I'm always speaking my truth, if we, I'm sorry, we, if we are always, I don't mean this, it's just me, I mean all of us. When we speak our truth all the time and we never defer and allow other people to have their perspective, we never defer and say, oh, oh, I hear you. 
I honor that. If we don't ever do that, it's out of balance. If I'm always being vulnerable and I, am, I don't have the option or the power to say, I can be kind in this place or cheerful, even if I feel sad inside, I can still show up this way because I have choice. Or if I'm always being, that, that's when we're repressed, actually. We can't actually choose. We're being forced. We're forcing ourselves to be a certain way. When the person who was always sad, I didn't really actually feel like she was all sad. I just felt like it was sort of a, I'm going to be sad all the time because that's what vulnerable, vulnerability is. But if I'm always polite and I have to repress that part of me that is vulnerable, then that is out of line. So are you you're getting this? So authenticity is being able to be connected with our heart and respond to what is happening in my environment with respect and with authenticity. So we don't have to let go of all our rituals of respect because I think so many of them are so beautiful and create such a beautiful energy. And at the same time, we don't want to follow that, respect that so much that we have to shut down who we are or what we're really feeling. And so we find those places where we can share who, what we really are and what we're really feeling. And, and eventually, they start to work much more harmoniously together. So let's just, on this beautiful rainy day, even as we connected with our heart space of all the universe being right here in spiritual life, let's just connect with our heart now again because we really want this to be um, a way of life connecting with our heart so i'm just inviting you now to connect with your heart again we did it at the beginning of service in suzanne's song at the beginning of the talk we're doing it again is there anything going on differently in your heart now than there was at the beginning of service what is your heart authentically telling you now? Sometimes when I connect with my heart, as I am right now, the, the feeling is all I want is the divine. That's all I want is God. I know some of you feel that way too. That's like the most authentic moment sometimes. That's all I want. When I come here on a Sunday morning, I want to feel God. I want to feel that presence, that love that surrounds and unfolds all of us. I want to feel it flowing through all of us. I want to know that it is, it's love that is, doesn't come and go. It is truly unconditional. It doesn't have conditions. It doesn't demand us to be any way other than who we are. <sighs> that unconditional love, it's that unconditional part that's so extraordinary, so awe-inspiring. That's what I, my heart wants right now. Anyone want to share? You don't have to, but if anyone's feeling like they want to share what your heart is wanting or revealing to you, does they want to share what's going on in your heart right now? All right, well, let's just pray then. Knowing we are connected heart to heart, that all our heart's deepest desires are being met even now, and that even as you called forth your deepest intention at the beginning of service today of how you want to feel when you leave here today, that, that your heart, that presence, that divine knowing, that divine love intelligence that is infinite and eternal heard that call and is that call and is fulfilling that deepest heart intent even now. Nothing can block our heart's intentions. And when we do have those blocks, when we do have those vulnerabilities, when we do have those shames, when we do have that not enoughness, when we do have that unworthiness, that is part of the answer to the prayer. Those, things are, those are the very things that can often open and break open our heart to even greater beauty and greater harmony and greater love. So we give thanks for them. We welcome them. We welcome whatever shows up. It is answer prayer. We let go of all our judgments of what this answer prayer is supposed to look like and accept that everything that is unfolding right here and right now is answer prayer, is an answer to your deepest heart intention. We open our heart to whatever is showing up 
it is answer prayer. And we welcome it, and we go deeply into it, and we go deeply into it, and we go deeply into it until we are living forever in this infinite embrace of pure, unlimited, un unconditional love. We were made from this unconditional love. We were birthed as unconditional love. We are always radiating and pulsating this unconditional love, and we will leave this planet as unconditional love. And all these wonderful human experiences, the challenging and heartbreaking ones, and the beautiful celebratory ones are all this beautiful dance of unconditional love. There's nothing that's happening in our life that is outside of this unconditional love, so we feel it. We allow ourselves to be enveloped in it. We say yes to it. We say yes to it as never before. And we hold this power and this presence of unconditional love in every area of our life, in every relationship, in every circumstance. And we let go of the conditions and move to the unconditions. Just that one shift from conditions to unconditions. The most powerful shift we can make. And as we hold this for ourselves, for the ones we love, we hold it for this planet as it continues to evolve and unfold. Even, I don't know, for today, as for some reason, I'm just aware of the war in Ukraine that just seems to keep going on and the devastation that's happening and homes that have been destroyed, lives that have been destroyed. And we just, we feel in our heart everything that's going on there and knowing that they are brothers and our sisters all of it everything that's happening there is part of this unconditional love and it hurts it hurts so much when we feel the pain of other people that seems people we don't even know and yet it seems so completely pointless from a distance ah oh, why so much pain and devastation why there's no purpose for it we know that and yet there it is and so we go deep and deep and deep into our hearts, into greater love, to open, to be, be curious, to understand, to feel it, to not run from it, to open to the healing power of light and love in the midst of what seems utterly unhealable. We are courageous journeyers into unconditional love of all the earth's circumstances, those that are close to us and personal to us and those that are on the other side of the world. It is all part of us. It is all part of us now. And as we continue to do this, we know that there is a light that is shining that never is dimmed. That we are this light. This presence and this divine presence is ever present as this light and never goes away. It shines through our hearts and as our hearts and in our hearts for all life for all that we are, for all that our family is, for all that our friends are, for all our work, colleagues, community, and the planet, for the earth and the environment, the plants and the animals. There's no limit in the galaxies and cosmos. There's no limit. We are the light. Our heart is authentically, truly the light. And we allow ourselves to be that healing presence wherever we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being that light. In divine gratitude, we let it be. And I invite you to join me now in saying, and so it is. I walk in God in all I do. I walk in God in all that I say.